Hello all and welcome back to Witch Fix. Today is another circle of three book that I'm going to be looking at and this is book 10, Making the Saint. This book marks the two third point in the series which is 15 books long. So the fifth book of the series was in The Dreaming which um, sort of changed the course of the girls stories uh, because of their experiences at the Midsummer Festival and I think basically that book marked what was going to happen in the books after it obviously Kate had a choice to make between uh, Scott and Tyler so whether to choose a normal boyfriend inverted quote marks or a Wiccan boyfriend and following that in the books after that she had to choose between Wicca and her normal life and it all came out to her parents and she had to struggle with that uh, Cooper had to struggle with things to do with her music and creativity uh, which is what happened in the festival where she met spider and was sort of put through the ringer a little bit uh, and that mirrored how she was put through the ringer over wearing her pentacle she had to fight for for what she believed in and annie had to face up to death uh, in the oak and holly king battle and then she went on to face up to her parents death death in general because of the death of her friend ben at the old people's home uh, and the death of the self sort of because she went through that thing where she aspected freya and changed dramatically and became a, a more a different person she kind of evolved as a character so i felt like this book was maybe going to be the start of the final arc which will take us into the the final five books of the series it didn't really feel like it, it was going to i didn't really like the preceding book very much which was through the veil because i felt it was a bit rushed in places and that the ending didn't make a lot of sense and I was specifically unhappy with the way in which the fantasy elements that had been in some of the books were suddenly meshed in with the more realistic elements um, and I felt that, that was a way that it didn't really make sense uh, for various reasons in that I like there to be a distance between what the reader can assume is the experience of the individual witch and what is actually happening in inverted quote marks in reality so they're just sitting there meditating, but internally they're having this experience of meeting the goddess, which is very akin to my experience of Wicca in that you don't actually see the goddess in the room with you, but yes, you do feel her presence. And I didn't really like how non-Wiccan characters were now suddenly just seeing the goddess visiting them. Um, it was just a quite a strange turn for me. Unfortunately, this book kind of was very much in the vein of that book. I feel like as we're going through the series, there's a much less definition between each individual book. The plot elements are sort of leaking out into each other. And it now kind of feels like I'm reading one book, which has just been broken up into chunks, if that makes sense, which I feel like it does. So in this book, uh, Making the Saint, we're very much still dealing with the fallout of Through the Veil. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on with Kate and Annie and Tyler in the sort of love tri triangle because as we know Annie kissed Tyler in the last book and has kind of a crush on him and Kate isn't allowed to see Tyler because her parents don't like the fact that he is a witch. Cooper also continues to associate with her new friend Jane and to talk to Jane's grandpa who's a concentration camp survivor. That doesn't really come into the book that much but I feel like we're building maybe towards something else and Annie is very much still involved in this crush that she has on Tyler and very little else really uh, again I feel like Annie is sort of losing out in terms of plot lines the overarching plot of making the saint was about the girls getting into a new phase of their year and a day of study and they are asked to basically pull a subject out of a hat to study and that subject is uh, an alternative pagan tradition so a religion that might be considered under the pagan bracket um, but isn't to do with Wicca and isn't a form of Wicca. Uh, I was initially confused because like I said in my previous review usually you can tell what the book's going to be about from the title because they're, they're pretty pagan-y titles like So Mote It Be or Through the Veil or In the Dreaming and you kind of get a sense of maybe what's going to happen like a midsummer night's dream in the dreaming through the veil sowin ghosts etc but making the saint really confused me and it turns out that it's a reference to kate drawing 
Santeria as her practice to investigate and research. The other two uh, characters, Cooper draws Celtic shamanism and Annie draws something which I know I'm going to mispronounce, but it's Asatru, I believe, uh, Asatru, um, which is like a, a Norse religion, essentially. I'd briefly heard about it in other books where it's just sort of mentioned as like oh yeah this is a thing but I don't know a lot about it and to be honest the book because it wasn't really about Annie didn't really teach me anything about it aside from the fact that um the one thing Annie kind of gets from her research is that she thinks that it's about loyalty to your clan which obviously clashes with her disloyalty to Kate by um having a crush on her boyfriend and then acting on that crush behind her back. We don't really get to hear anything about Cooper's experiments with Celtic shamanism either, except that she does a guided meditation to find her totem animal, which I don't really know anything about Celtic shamanism. Um, when I see people talking about totem, totem animals specifically, as in totem animals, that phrase, they're usually referring to Native American spirituality, so um, that confused me a little bit, but as I said, I don't really know a lot about it. The bulk of the book is taking up with Kate visiting a botanica, which is um, sort of the Santeria equivalent of Crone's Circle, the witch shop that they usually go to in the town that they're in. Uh, she goes there to do some research, ask some questions as part of her research and as part of the witchcraft class. And she gets invited to observe a ritual, which she does, and she becomes embroiled in Santeria from that point. I don't know a huge amount about Santeria. I sort of have seen various things about it but nothing really in detail. The book does explain it a little bit but um, I wanted to make sure that it was actually being represented properly because I don't want to go in and say oh yeah this book is about Santeria when actually the author might have made everything up because I feel like they've been pretty true to generic wicca as in wicca that doesn't have like a prefix like dianic wicca or celtic wicca but um i don't know what the author's involvement if any is with santeria so i wanted to go and have a look uh from the brief little bits of research that i've done it seems like they've used all the words correctly um there's obviously a lot more to it than was in this book this is a, a pretty basic description of it um but basically what i got from the book is that it's a kind of twofold spirituality where the and I apologize if I'm going to say all of these words wrong there's Orishas who are sort of like gods uh, who have been equated with Catholic saints to kind of hide or not really hide but to allow the practitioners to practice their magic and religion even when they were being brought to America as slaves and deprived of their own religious traditions so it was kind of mixed in with catholicism and the saints so you have like the orishas and then you have the saints that mirror them and one of the main practices that feature in this book is riding which uh, kate views at this ceremony that she goes to which is where an orisha like not possesses but kind of takes control of the body of uh, a celebrant and participates in rituals in that way and it's sort of like um when in wiccan traditions people will like draw down the goddess i guess and at the ceremony kate is approached by a specific uh orisha which is riding one of the attendants and he identifies her as one of uh, as one of his children um, which is apparently very unusual that he would just do that to an outsider and so she begins to have this relationship with him and I'll talk a little bit more about what that involves in a little bit. I'm just going to go through the book and my bookmarks from start to finish because I had some issues with this one. Going back to what I said before about how the fantasy and reality bits are being meshed together, at the start Kate is sitting down with her therapist and she's talking about the ritual that ended the last book which is when they saw Annie's parents as ghosts uh, talking to Annie and Kate says it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen Kate told her therapist her parents ghosts were just holding her and then they disappeared and Cooper and I hugged her and then there's a sort of paragraph long explanation of basically what happened in the previous book and then the therapist says do you really believe you saw ghosts that night and I don't know that this is something you want to discuss with your therapist especially a therapist that you're 
parents are insisting that you see because they believe that wicker is somehow turning your brain and making you believe in all this weird and kooky stuff i mean telling her that you actually saw ghosts is i mean i'd be concerned and i'm actually a practitioner of wicker so i don't know what this therapist is going to make of it so again i wasn't really happy about those two worlds kind of colliding quite a lot of what happens in the book is either a reference to something that happened in one of the previous books or a sort of follow-on non-event for example kate decides when her brother kyle comes home from college that she's going to ask for his help because even though her parents have sort of made peace with the fact that she's interested in wicker they're still not letting her see tyler her boyfriend the theory being that they think he's the one who got her involved in wicker and that she's not allowed to see him she'll just lose interest because it's just something she's doing to fit in with her boyfriend so kate asks kyle who is a very supportive older brother apparently um if you know he can talk to their parents and say like look you have to let her see her boyfriend because this is her decision to make but instead of supporting her he starts kind of mocking her for thinking that she's a witch and making various comments about oh why don't you just wiggle your nose to get this that and the other done around the house and nothing really comes of that it's just sort of it feels like filler uh, and then most of the action takes place towards the end of the book again very similar to the previous book and it feels like it's all very kind of rushed and it's packed into uh, a very small number of pages the actual action um when i was actually got to the bit that was stuff happening it said that i only had 12 minutes left in the book um because at the bottom of the screen there's like a little counter on the kindle that tells you like how long it's going to take you to finish uh, and i was like oh well 12 minutes isn't very long and then it turned out to be even less long because at the end of the book there was kind of an afterward written by the author about experimenting with different traditions and a clip from the next book so it, it was actually more like eight minutes i guess so Kate is asked to look into Santeria. That's sort of the main plot of the book. She goes to the Botanica, which she's been told is the best place to go to learn about it. And she meets uh, a girl called Madeleine and her mother. Uh, her mother is a madrina, uh, who's a person who performed her daughter's like initiation, I guess. And various other words and things are sort of introduced and explained uh, by Madeleine like uh, asienta which is apparently a ceremony and basically uh, the final initiation i guess you could equate it with finishing your year in a day of study and being initiated although you have to go through a number of initiations before that happens this is like the final one into the mysteries so maybe you could equate it to like third degree coven initiation i don't really know um but yeah they're very briefly explained there's not a huge amount of detail given to what's actually happening so you kind of have to take it at face value at the ritual kate is approached by a woman who is being ridden by ogun um which again i'm not sure i'm saying that right but it's spelled o double g u n uh, who is one of the orishas you find out later that he is representative of warriors metalwork knives um, basically things of that ilk and that he likes cigars and rum it's basically the only things you learn about him in this book as i said it's pretty general information but um kate is kind of shocked by this and she goes back to the botanica to ask them about it and they get a guy who is also recognized as one of like ogun's children to put kate in contact with him and then uh, during that process uh, Ogun comes forth rides this new man who isn't really around for a very long time so I forget his name but um, the end result of that is he asks that Kate be given a necklace which is a necklace of his beads and his colours to mark her as one of his children and then she goes home and she does a sort of experimental uh, summoning of him if you like she does a sort of dance to some drum music uh, and she has like a little altar set up with a knife and some rum and some cigars uh, and she's basically just experimenting with calling him unfortunately kate by this point is also quite suspicious that something is going on with annie and tyler because annie keeps blushing and acting weird whenever tyler is mentioned and tyler is acting quite distant whenever kate happens to run into him at crone's circle and unbeknownst to kate um annie and tyler have kissed a bit and then decided that 
because Kate is Annie's friend, this can't go any further. Tyler wants to break up with Kate because he feels like they're not right for each other, but Annie and Tyler both know that they can't date because obviously he's dated Kate and that would put a strain on their friendship. Kate doesn't know this, so what she does is she calls to Ogan and then asks him for help with the issue and what she actually says is I want the truth about Tyler and Annie to come out she said I want to know what they're doing help me find out she paused a moment uncertain of whether or not to continue there was something else that had been on her mind something else she wanted to ask but she wasn't sure if it was something she should do she started to turn away from the little altar on her desk without saying anything else she'd already asked for enough but then she stopped and turned back Maybe she should do it, she thought. After all, fair was fair, and magic was all about balance. She looked at the cigar and the rum. She pictured Papa Ogan smoking the cigar, blowing smoke rings out of his mouth before taking a drink. She pictured him smiling at her. Ask me, child, she heard him say in her mind. She took a breath. The drums pounded in her head. If they are cheating on me, she said, then I want them to be punished for it. This is at the 79% mark in the book and it's basically what kicks off any actual action in the story because Kate is asking for vengeance which sort of goes against what she's learned about Wicca so far and um, what happens is that Annie is working at the old people's home and she accidentally while chopping carrots cuts her finger with a knife and not just a little cut but cuts it like right down to the bone and it needs stitches and when she shows up to the wicker class that night Kate sees this and she hears what happened and she knows that she is the cause of it or thinks that she's the cause of it and she doesn't want anything else bad to happen to her friends so she goes sprinting off to the botanica to ask for their help in stopping whatever it is that she's unleashed and they give her um some items to take to a tree in the park which is considered sacred and a place to leave offerings she goes and leaves them there and asks uh, thanks papa ogan for his protection but asks him to take it no further and to, to leave annie and tyler alone and then at the end she talks to annie and tyler she breaks up with tyler and she tells annie that she's angry with her but that she isn't going to stay angry essentially she will get over it and she hopes that they'll be friends later on and she also tells her about how she was responsible for the the incident with the knife that all takes place in the sort of last maybe 20 percent of the book so like not a huge amount of time for like the main plot elements to happen the rest of the book is just dealing with annie feeling guilty kate finding out about santeria and cooper dealing with her parents deciding to get divorced because they separated in the last book but these are kind of non-issues, like nothing really happens with them. It's just a development of an issue that doesn't ever reach a head. So there isn't really a crisis point in the novel. I think it is quite interesting um, the way that the introduction of this idea that you go and look at other spiritual traditions while you're doing your study. And I think it does make a lot of sense. Um, what the people at the witch shop that they go to, Crone Circle, say about it is that Basically, it's looking at other traditions to help you understand your own and just to like experiment with other things and find out about them and to understand things. Because obviously, when you don't understand something, it can lead to fear and it can lead to hatred. And a lot of the things that we saw in the prejudice that was discussed in the five paths. So I feel like they managed to do that pretty well without going into the realm of the dreaded cultural appropriation. Kate's experience with Santeria is kind of walking that knife edge pun intended because uh, on the one hand she is worshipping a deity and doing rituals that are not from her culture because I mean she's a white Canadian and on the other she has been invited in by practitioners of Santeria she's been allowed to observe rituals and she has been spoken to by one of their deities or orishas uh, and welcomed as one of his children so it's sort of like she's not appropriating the culture she's being brought into it by this uh, relationship with deity but also I think you can put it down to cultural appreciation because she's not just using this as a place to mine ideas for her own Wiccan practice she's actually learning about it from practitioners she's participating in it properly and 
with guidance. So I think this probably comes more into the realm of cultural appreciation, which is definitely something that Wiccans need to be aware of in our practice. There was this whole discussion online um, that I saw recently. Basically, Sephora were going to start selling these witch introduction kits which I don't think should be sold through Sephora because they sell makeup and I definitely don't think they should be like $50 for just a rose quartz crystal and some sage and some tarot cards. The sage was also what annoyed quite a lot of people because that's white sage and endangered and it's a Native American spiritual tool white sage it's not something that is just for Wiccans it's something that has been taken from Native American spirituality and which is being misused and which is leading to that plant becoming endangered so that really shone the spotlight on things like that and where we've all unthinkingly been using sage smudge sticks which you can buy in like any kind of occult shop um for not a lot of money but it means that those have been taken and that plant has been probably not harvested in a proper way or a sustainable way and it's not particularly responsible so i do think it's something that even though this book was published in 2001 it still has relevance today in the sense that when you're looking at other spiritual traditions you can't just take things from them without really understanding them uh, and what they mean you have to do your research and where possible speak to people who are actually involved in it the postscript from the author talks about experiencing different religious practices with people that you know with friends um, family members and it doesn't just talk about pagan spirituality like uh, santeria and celtic shamanism and a saltru which i don't know how to pronounce um but it also talks about um judaism and hinduism and it talks about like if that is the tradition of your family which you were in before you started practicing wicca why not invite uh wiccans you know or friends to participate in the rituals of that to demystify it to teach people different aspects of spirituality and i think that's quite a nice idea it's quite a complicated idea to tackle in a teen fiction novel and i feel like it could have been given more time in the novel itself as opposed to the majority of it being about various personal problems that didn't really get resolved anyway but um, it's definitely a brave attempt to include something that was a much broader issue than is usually handled in these books there are five books left in the series so i'm excited to get through those the next book in the series is the house of winter which judging by the fact that this book takes place just after Samhain uh, I'm guessing the house of winter deals with Yule so um we've nearly come full circle haha <laughs> pun intended again on the whole uh, year and a day of study because I think they started out going to a Beltane celebration or Imolk one of the the earlier in the year celebrations um and obviously we've now reached the end of the year so we'll be circling back up to Imolk and Beltane pretty soon which makes sense because we're nearing the end of the book series so I'm quite excited to see what they do for that one and to see what's going on I'm also excited because one of the books is called uh, And It Harm None and there's a picture of a heart on the front which is on fire which suggests to me that we're going to see some curses or some more spells or magic uh, that has been cast and potentially potentially used against the main three characters so i think that will be really exciting if that's actually what happens in it so stay tuned as always you can get in touch on twitter if you did find a copy of the circle of three books that come up next and it's affordable let me know tweet me at witchfix or email me witchfixpodcast at gmail.com and you can also leave youtube comments if you're listening on youtube on castbox you can't comment but you can get in touch with me one of the other ways so i look forward to hearing from you and i'll see you in the next episode bye <laughs>